Okay, let's begin our Module 4 lecture series. Uh, we're going to get into trade theory first, really just as a, as a way of review. Um, this is something you should have come across in your introductory classes, at least in terms of definition, so we'll try to flesh those out a little bit, uh, just to get at the idea of what is different, um, try to, to, to provoke our minds into thinking about why tax and tariff policy might look a little different when we're thinking about two countries exchanging goods rather than within a single domestic economy me trying to buy from some other uh, person and us facing a tax in between us. Um, yeah, so trade theory can be split into two categories really. The first is called uh, partial equilibrium and it's really this idea that you could take a snapshot or slice of the economy and lift it out and it's really distinguished primarily by one good. Um, and so when we've talked in the past about tariffs, um, I, you would have seen me draw on the board um, the, the export supply curve and the import demand curve and we're talking about a single good and the supply side comes from one country the demand side comes from another and and we put a tariff in place and we measured out the welfare effects and and who was you know sort of getting the burden of that tariff that's called partial equilibrium because we are lifting that economy out or that that market out of an economy that is all connected um, the if for some reason there's a tariff and the export supply quantity falls then trace it back into that country where the the exports were coming from and you have an effect and we've talked about those so the export supply of soybeans in the US and so what happens well the returns to soybeans may fall and the next round of decisions may be um, the returns per acre of corn or wheat are now more valuable and so we've now made our way into a second market where the trade policy effects may occur and that's really the notion of general equilibrium so we move from a partial setting to a general equilibrium setting and you get something like that, that I was just describing called the feedback effect or uh, probably the better term would be relative prices and multiple markets now, I know it sounds complicated, and it certainly can be. It was uh, uh, a big piece of my research is working in general equilibrium studies of trade, um, focusing on agriculture and looking at relationships between agricultural product markets and agricultural uh, food and processed other processed agriculture markets, as well as uh, agricultural land and labor and so uh, that's a lot of different markets to connect together and, and try to understand but we can get at the sort of core trade impact using just two goods uh, implicitly when we talk about two goods we are talking about the input packages that might be used to make those two goods you're gonna hear me say something about the talk about the costs but it, it turns out if we are willing to pick one good and say this good is valued at this amount and it requires this amount of inputs then all we need is a production frontier that compares those two goods the two marketable goods and uh, we will implicitly have covered the inputs you need two goods two countries and you're already in general equilibrium you've now connected two markets together across two countries and you have moved from this sort of snapshot idea into this feedback idea okay and that's really these terms we're not going to talk about them again um, after this slide really except to say that that, that we should distinguish uh, uh, the, the sort of scope uh, of what we're doing this one uh, sort of stops at one good general equilibrium is expansive and so if we prove something in general equilibrium if you can prove something when two goods are in related markets then you have a much more concrete proof that expands out and in fact the results at the end of this lecture we're gonna I'll, I'll note some sort of absolute truths right 
uh, as far as we can get in trade and economic theory in terms of absolute truths. Uh, most sort of trade policy studies focus on partial equilibrium. If we are concerned about the trade war and what are the effects of sort of uh, uh, tariffs on soybeans um, and, and looking at volumes, then you, you try to get a really detailed picture of who participates in those markets and, and how those effects are, are playing out. Um, you want something more complex, something like looking at NAFTA uh, or agriculture and non-agriculture, all the sort of items that exist in the trade war, uh, and trying to understand not just price effects but also where the labor and jobs going up and down, those kind of things, then you end up with general equilibrium. and. It's an applied field, uh, meaning that we collect data and, and pretend uh, that these economies act as behavioral agents, and, uh, and we, we work through that. Uh, um, and that, that is not specific to general equilibrium. The, the idea that the country is the agent or the acting uh, decision maker is a big piece of trade theory. Now, we know that all the purchases in the US are from you and from me and all of us sort of deciding on what we want to buy together seeing what's available in the market and then there's some trade agents out there who make purchases and they try to put together sort of the national supply at retail uh, of a set of goods and so you go to um, shop for a car and you'll have lots of different options and those have sort of been bundled by by import agents, but really they're trying, they're being driven by our own preferences, by the heterogeneity of the population. And so it would be really odd for us to think about, you know, car from Japan, car from Korea, car from US, right, in a, in a trade model, because um, we all think of brands, but that's sort of what the trade model is doing. It's setting the agent up as the shipper of, you know, car. Uh, or the purchaser or the importer of car. Um, so what does that mean? Well, in, in practice we're saying that there's sort of a single rational decision maker acting on behalf of the country. They sort of recognize all of the preferences that exist, the income power, purchasing power, um, and, and all of that. Uh, does it work? Well, if the country and the sort of production side of the country uh, for its own goods and sales markets have a bunch of small acting competitors and they don't have a lot of market power or if there's a single seller um, whether they have market power or not then that model works fine um, and I bring up the car example because the car example uh, doesn't fit well into a lot of trade models and so you actually have to not do sort of the uh, the kind of basic GE structure we're looking at here, the basic trade structure we're looking at here, but you need to get into a model that considers what if there's some market power and maybe market power that crosses borders. Um, why do we do this? Well, one, I mean, the data load gets large quick. Uh, one of the reasons people do partial equilibrium is you can get a lot of detailed data on a single product and which countries buy and sell. Uh, now, if you expand that out and say, I need all the transactions in the economy, uh, the burden gets high. And so we rely on large databases that look at, um, that, that, that collect information on some goods, and we try to, to build out from those. Um, but, you know, the, the national agent part of this works okay. It's, um, you know, it, its main sort of benefit is we know that across borders between two countries economic resource reallocation is is more expensive it's higher cost to make exchanges across any border uh, than it is within a, a country and so we get that sort of information gap filled uh, with the trade data and it helps us to understand something about the domestic markets as well. Uh, language, laws, other institutions, um, so these are sort of basic institutions. Uh, I'm going to talk about formal institutions in a later lecture. Uh, tend to be uniform within nations and not across uh, borders. 
Um, so, and then of course, political barriers. So we have sovereignty over the laws in our own country. We do not have much input into laws and our trading partners uh, into their country. And so uh, there's sort of this asymmetric idea. And again, all of this sort of works to make the national trade agent work kind of well because the government sort of is the constraining factor in, in what you're allowed to do. Uh, not so, well, not less so uh, within a country. Um, so if you have a national agent, you, that means you have a national sort of producer or national production plan uh, that, that sits inside of a trade model. And generally, what you're going to see is a country exports what it can produce cheaply. A country imports what it cannot produce cheaply, right? So the idea is to sort of fill the gaps. And that, that word cheaply is going to keep coming up, and we're going to see that what we're really driving for is talking about cheap in the relative sense. Uh, so everything may be very low cost, uh, but when we compare them, one will be lower than the other, and uh, that may mean that we should be specializing in the thing that is the lowest relative cost, and in fact that is going to be the result. Okay, so we have this concept of advantage, and we're going to talk through it. Uh, so again, the national sort of producer agent, and what do we produce cheap? and what is more expensive or relatively expensive for us to produce and, and get our first term called absolute advantage. It's just an absolute comparison. It's a level type cost. Uh, comparison of the cost of production uh, of identical goods in two different countries. So you have something called food in Canada, something called food in the United States. Um, if when controlling for transport costs and, and exchange rates, uh, whatever else may be required to get to sort of a real price measure. If food is cheaper to produce in the US than it is in Canada, then we have a re absolute advantage in the production of food. Um, if we were to, to drill down into that, we might see that the US has absolute advantage in lots of products. Uh, in agriculture and, and Canada may have only a few um, you know they have shorter seasons um, you know different soils um, and, and so forth now if you were to think about foodstuffs in general or sort of crop production um, think about oh, like if I get an email you guys are gonna see it sorry um, let me fix that well, maybe that'll fix that. Um, okay, so I think I was talking about other products. So if we think about uh, crops in the southern U.S., uh, as you move down to more temperate uh, climate, um, they produce things that are produced in tropical and, and more temperate areas. Um, and so it turns out the U.S. produces rice and we produce cotton, but we probably aren't the absolute. Uh, there are probably a bunch of producers, producing countries that we trade with that have the absolute advantage in those products. So we should ask what drives absolute advantage, and it's really just resources, productivity, so the resource base, uh, and then the you know productivity being the technology, the ability to turn those things, uh, resources into marketable goods. Uh, so example one, if a country has abundant, cheap labor, it may have an absolute advantage in nearly all labor-intensive goods. Um, that is that is sort of the story of the U.S. when we talk about manufacturing, where the sort of the, the technology of factories or plants uh, has become very mobile and easy to replicate anywhere, um, then the driver may be that how, how, how inexpensively can you staff um, that factory. Example two, productive soils topography that allow for efficient mechanical plant harvests gives the U.S. That's the driver of U.S. absolute advantage in a lot of crops. And so then the question becomes, you know, if it is the case that we identified this country with cheap labor and, and lots of ability to make labor-intensive goods, um, you know, do they become export specialists in that good and it's certainly something we've seen 
And the same thing with the U.S., since we maybe know a little more about that, having this absolute advantage, you know, the trade theory says, you know, if it is the cheap thing for you to make, make a lot of it, and what's left over, trade it, sell it, and you should be able to trade it for the things that are relatively expensive for you to make. And that should say that if you're an exporter of your absolute advantage, don't import any of it. And that is something that we don't see, right? In fact, we export wheat, we import wheat. We export some rice, we import rice. Uh, we export oil seeds, we import oil seeds. Um, some of that is made up of varietal differences and different needs by industries and so forth, that there may be some quality differences that exist. Uh, but some of it is just, this persists. And so that is something we should uh, acknowledge and, and move ahead. As we move ahead with our theory here, think about, and we'll get to it in the second lecture. Um, okay, so moving beyond after absolute advantage, we have to think about the real crux of this is comparative advantage. The idea that it's not just what do you make cheaply, but if you are going to be limited by national resource constraints, what labor and land and capital do you have, then what choices are you going to make? And so this concept of comparative advantage, owing it to Ricardo, a lot of people will, will say Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, 1776, but Ricardo is sort of the um, uh, the more economics-based reference. Uh, Adam Smith was really more philosophizing, uh, and Ricardo was sort of the proof, the you know the the detailed proof of this. Um, basically, says in exchange economics, um, there, this concept of comparative advantage is what leads to efficiency gains or income gains from trade. And it's a guaranteed result under very easy to see conditions. And when you see economists line up in the news or, or wherever and say, ah, we shouldn't be placing tariffs on these things, it's expensive. Well, that's the expensive thing they're talking about. So that when I say generic disdain, it's it's sort of reactionary. You see a tariff and you say, Oh, well, we're we're imposing some costs here, we're imposing some costs there. And essentially, we are we are choosing to to pay higher prices. Right? We are enforcing a higher prices. And you'll see a talk from Milton Friedman when he basically calls protection uh, the protection of consumers from from low costs or from low prices. And that's that's sort of the same thing. Uh, the core concept uh, behind comparative advantage is a country is constrained in its production. You're going to get resource endowments, right? So they, the, a country has these things, they're ready to turn into marketable goods, but they're they're limited, and that that limitation, the idea that you don't make more of the endowment side, you don't make more labor when you've used it all, um, you don't make more land when you've planted everything, that is the constraining factor, and that puts. Uh, when you take those along with whatever technology is available, even the best technology, they give you what you might call a national production possibilities frontier. So you guys know what that is. It's the bowed out uh, trade-off curve between two goods. And what we're talking about two goods here is just X and Y. And I did not draw it. We have drawn it on the board several times, but it's the, the bowed out trade-off between two goods. And that sets the that sets that boundary. It says, are we going to be a country that produces X? We're going to be a country that produces Y. Are we going to produce both? Some mix of the two. And if we are producing some mix, or we are making those choices, then this comparative advantage says that when we decide to expand production of X, then we could think of that cost. We could think of the cost in terms of what does it require, what do we use, but in the production possibilities frontier context, it really just has an opportunity cost in terms of good Y. Let's say we, we're currently making five units of X, five units of Y. If we expand um, and make six units of X, the resource endowments, the technology say that, okay, we don't know exactly where Y will be, but it has to be lower. It has to have that opportunity cost. And so figuring out what that opportunity cost is, figuring out what the trade-off is, to get one more unit of X 
is going to be critical and that's what we're going to compare across countries when we decide who makes a good cheap uh, relatively cheaply or relatively expensively. And so when you do that comparison between X and Y for a single country you'll say um, the trade-off becomes relatively cheap for one good and relatively expensive for the other because they have to be inverted in terms of their costs and so when you compare two countries one will have the comparative advantage in one of the goods and another will have uh, comparative advantage in the other okay and so if uh, if it is the case in the US that X is sort of a agricultural good and Y is a, a labor-intensive good then the expansion of X at the cost of Y um, should be relatively cheap compared to a country that does not have abundant land resources to plant crops. But if they're late, if they have a large population, um, you know, densely populated, lots of opportunity for labor uh, and and sort of production uh, of what what you might call um, low skill labor goods, then it'll be relatively expensive for them to try to expand agricultural production uh, because they'll be losing a lot and not gaining much, right? It takes a lot to, to sort of overcome the lack of land resources. And so in that, that picture, you, you can already see the U.S. should be sort of the specialist in exporting land uh, requiring goods and, and some other trading partner should have a comparative advantage um, in producing labor intensive goods. And that says nothing about the actual cost. The, the U.S. could easily have an absolute advantage in both, right? Um, but the result isn't for absolute advantage, it's the uh, comparative advantage. Okay, it's about the trade-off. Okay, so the results from these sort of GE trade models, maybe you already know them. This is sort of the, when you get the definition of comparative advantage, someone originally should have told you this um, when you first saw it, but the result is as long as the countries have different trade-off rates, and we expect them to in the real world, um, meaning that when I make one more ton of soybeans, um, in the US, the cost in terms of uh, how much production of, um, I don't know, uh, beanie hats is not the same as it is in some other country that we trade with. Okay, and if those are the two goods, the only two goods in the world, soybeans versus uh, beanie hats, then um, it must be the case that the US will be. Uh, have a relatively cheap cost of expanding um, soybeans and that means that the other country must have the rel relatively cheap cost uh, in bean hats and they, they should they should specialize they should make as much as they can and and trade to get those gains so what does it do well um, sorry the result then if you expand that out beyond two goods a country will always have a comparative advantage in at least one product and comparative disadvantage in some other product. That is the result of Ricardo's model. If you start doing comparative advantage, it's impossible to have the comparative advantage in every product. Even if you have the absolute advantage in every product, it must be the case that you're giving up too much relative to the other country, the trading partner, in at least one product okay that it would be better for you to do that and that result guarantees then um, we'll get a numerical example in the next lecture but the that result guarantees that there are mutually advantageous trade opportunities so the idea is there's a trading system that as long as people are trading things they have comparative advantage in they export things they have comparative advantage in then both countries get a gain out of it. Now how they share the potential gain is where trade um, disputes come into play and where trade sort of uh, games, game theory uh, plays out. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about the general result that these trade opportunities will raise income in both countries and allow both countries, the, the key part, to consume combinations of a good that they could never achieve in autarky. So this the secondary 
result here is that if you produce as an isolationist country, autarky, meaning you don't exchange without outside of your uh, your border, you produce everything that you can consume, and you only consume things that you produce, right? Uh, that case will always be uh, have a smaller set of opportunities than when you open up trade because of the comparative advantage rule. Okay, that's the end of uh, lecture one. We'll we'll stop that out, and uh, and then next we'll do our our numerical example and hopefully get through that. Okay.